ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage designer and architect of the, and founder of award-winning international architect and design practice, Mitzi Studio, Mr. Jonathan Mitzi. Good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to talk about neo-futuristic architecture and why I believe it's uh, the way forward for Malta, for the world even. I'm formally trained as an architect. I also have a background in film, visual effects, animation, and uh, my studio, uh, we, we, we're fully multidisciplinary, so we tackle architecture, we do um, industrial design, uh, furniture, landscapes, everything really across every discipline um, across, and also at every scale. But we all uh, have a sort of shared holistic design process that is very much inspired by nature. Um, it's driven by technology and uh, it's delivered through a fusion of crafts, uh, be it uh, traditional or with, mixed with digital uh, craft. And we also do robotics. So if Andre, you want to build your robot, come speak to me after, I'll, I'll come find you. Um, and furniture and immersive uh, retail. So, uh, new futuristic architecture. First, I'm going to just show how innovation has evolved architecture with, very quickly within a few slides, and then discuss what is neo futurism, and, and then show you some precedents of neo futuristic architecture in practice around the world, and also how our studio is approaching design. Um, so, to start off, innovation is mankind's greatest tool. Uh, it's, the, it's the mother of necessity, born out of our necessity, in order for us to adapt, to survive, to progress as, 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 a, as a species. And after necessity comes imagination and curiosity. So if it's for shelter or for work or for, for worship, um, you know, we've always created spaces, spaces that match our function. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's architecture is very much a reflection of who we are and what we do. And naturally, it's evolved into an art form. Um, and there's a beautiful quote, uh, which I think really sums it all up. And it, it's by John Lasseter, who's the creative director of Pixar Animation Studio. And it's that art challenges technology, and technology inspires art. And it's this really beautiful circle or formula, recipe for uh, innovation. And so whether it's us for worship, building a pyramid for one pharaoh to live in his afterlife, and we've, it's taught us how to quarry stone and de develop tools to take us across deserts, or building cranes with our obsession to go higher and higher into the heavens. Um, that's us, that's our architecture challenging creative technology. But then there's also technology such as computer-aided design coming into this world, um, and computer-aided manufacturing, which is teaching us new forms of expression. So you've got this beautiful building by Frank Gehry, and Bilbao Guggenheim, which is really a, a fully new building in, um, you know, inspired by technology. So as we've gone through the ages, we've gone through loads of styles. Um, you've had Gothic Revival, Industrial, Art Nouveau, Art Deco, Modernism. The one thing that you can see about all these buildings on the screen are that they're all the very pinnacle of art and technology at that time. And, and that's why they've stood uh, the test of time, and that is why they are such a sort of hallmark, a landmark of that city. So you know, you've got uh, Big Ben, which is synonymous with London, uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, the Chrysler Building in, 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 uh, in New York. And, and with innovation uh, comes bold dreams, and with that also comes controversy uh, at times. Yeah, you know, the Eiffel Tower was, was ridiculed as being the ugliest lamppost in, in the city. And, and, Actually, it's gone on to become the most uh, visited attraction of Paris. And so, you know, architecture really has the power to ins inspire and empower and identify a city. But what's happened is beyond modernism, we've gotten to a point where actually things are spinning out of control and, and we're sort of not really innovating enough anymore. And what's happened is uh, there's this been mass population explosion of density. Uh, and we've gone from 6 billion going up to 9 billion in 2050. And we've entered a sort of culture of excess, consumerist greed, mass manufacturing. And uh, what's, what's resulted is we're actually starting to face a, a built reality of uh, that's really home to ugliness. This is 1,000 meters from where we are standing right now, where this beautiful fishing village 
and now look at it, you know, and I don't want my children to grow hair on my children's children. You know, it's a home to ugliness, a home to pollution, and a home to anxiety. And neo-futurism is called the architecture of hope. It's very linked to biomorphic design, which is about mimicking uh, nature and mimicking natural processes. Um, but it's also high technology, high tech architecture that's evolved with sustainable principles. So at its sort of basis levels, you probably know uh, works of Zaha Hadid and you know, uh, Calatrava with doing beautiful buildings such as shaped of sand dunes or, or birds. But at its best, it protects life, it adds social, economical, environmental value, and it ultimately makes life more beautiful. So I'm um, just now going to quickly show you um, our own work. And I'm going to start with a school that we're working on that's in the pipeline, going through planning. And it's, it's symbolic to talk about schools because really um, innovation starts with creative education. And uh, you know, we're here at the Malta Innovation Summit. We want to be the best island. We want to be the best in gaming. We want to be the best in blockchain. Actually, to be the best, firstly, we need enough schools. And we actually, I have friends out there who can't get their children into schools. But then we also need the best education, because to be the best, you need to attract the best. So we need the best education out there. And uh, Chiswick is all about a school that is nature-led, learning through the art of playing within nature. It's about rejecting the sort of classroom grid array approach, and it's about circular learning spaces. Circular tables, like we're all sitting in now, it's about developing interpersonal skills, better social skills. And uh, it's about creating architecture that blends seamlessly with our, our landscape. We've only developed 25% of our footprint of our site, and we've given the rest of the 75% back to nature, back to children being able to play within it. And we looked at a lot of schools in, in Finland, and this is a, a fantastic school, which really has a very dynamic internal space. But what we didn't like about it was that, oh, sorry, um, was that the boundaries were stopping nature in, and okay, they have cold weather there, but we don't have that issue. So we wanted to break down that boundary and really bring bring the nature s straight in. So we started off with this one embryo, with one learning space, and then we um, arrayed it around an assembly area, and we created, essentially, a, a uh, circular learning spaces around the pod, which we then brought nature right in around it. And the anatomy, its makeup, is uh, very similar to a plant, very similar to a flower. You know, a flower has a stigma, it's got ovules, the eggs, and then the petals grow out for the nutrients. And we're creating an assembly where we congregate, children go out and they nutrify. And the end result is an architectural seedling. You know, this a seedling that is mimics nature, it's mapped on the sky, and people say, oh, you're creating spaceships on our island. I'm like, yes, actually, they are spaceships to teleport and transport our children's minds to expand our horizons. And just because you have a limited budget, which we do, we have a normal school budget, doesn't mean you need to limit your imagination. Actually, that's why you really need to think hard to come up with ingenious ways. This school is made up of 42 modular learning spaces, but actually it's only got one component, replicated 336 times. We're building it off-site, one mold, faster time on-site, faster production, and the end result, even though they're modular, over a, a 3D, 3D landscape, it's actually a very asymmetric natural landscape. So, um, I'm now going to talk to you about a, a cafe we did in Westfield. Westfield's a big shopping mall in London. And uh, we created this building for a client of ours, Colici, and they're one of the biggest operators for the Royal Parks, the biggest caterers. And the first building, it was actually the first building we did ever in London when we started the studio, which is a, a welcome center in Bushy Park. And uh, we created their identity. It's a sine wave. It's also a leaf. And we wanted to sort of, it's the first time that the Colici family were going into an urban environment. So we wanted to sort of take their leaf and identity and just sort of blow it away, like a blowing leaf in autumn. And then we landed in an urban environment and we took the dying colors of pigmentation and beautiful ochres and we transformed that are using um, a noble material such as copper, which is uh, also a sustainable material, and it's sort of mutated into an urban environment. It's, it's highly competitive commercial uh, development, 350 stores, so we really needed to grab people's attention. So it's got multiple accesses. First one was right, we're going to stop people in their tracks. 
and we took inspiration from a, a king cobra, which, you know, when you enter cobra's territory, it really just jumps at you, so to stop you, and then, and then as you approach, it sort of defragments and reveals beautiful serpentine, uh, sorry, serpent or reptilian texture. And from the side, you've got the smile and from the leaf, and from the front, uh, we're really just mimicking a flower, sort of the m a mouth of an orchid. You know, flowers have evolved, survival of the fittest, beauty, color, scent. Um, it's all about luring bees in, bees in ultimately to sexually reproduce. And what we're doing as architects representing our clients is our function is for us to create, uh, is to enable them to multiply their coin. So all we're doing essentially is trying to get, trying to make bees swarm to pollinate on the counter. Um, and we fused the construction through ancient, or not ancient, 18th century um, copper sheathing techniques where you clad boats with rivets and brass, like the Cutty Sark in London. And we've created a computer-aided design pattern, 565 bespoke individual panels, and uh, we then copper sheathed them on. And then the end result is, you know, it, it, it is a sort of an expression that we uh, is, is quite uh, distinctly slightly different. You've kind of seen it before, but you haven't. And it went on to um, be the most recognized uh, building of the awards industry in the United Kingdom, second in the world in the, in the Restaurant Bar Design Award. And, and a, the good thing about that is that actually, as commercial developers, investing in good design can reap you all massive benefits. Now, not just financially at your point of sale daily in retail, but actually as your brand growth the same client and us, we went on then to win our biggest tender, or our client's biggest tender, and our biggest tender, which is uh, we're creating a whole new fleet of kiosks for the whole of the Royal Parks. This is um, at the Horseshoe, right in front of Buckingham Palace Gardens, and it's a, uh, a tree-like inspired uh, beacon of brass sculpture, functional sculpture, and we're, we're working across Kensington Gardens, Hyde Park, Green Park um, and St. James's Park. And it's all about being site sensitive. It's about creating a, you know, very organic, natural sculpture. Every single one is different because you know, it's always about surprise and delight. We are, are looking to really enrich the visitor experience of London uh, and something you identify. Kiosks are very small in nature, but they form a very important part of the uh, heritage of the makeup of London, being refreshment points, but also being beacons and wayfinders. So I'm going to quickly go fast because I know I'm going over time. Um, again, we've used natural uh, steam bending techniques to create, to create these expressions. This is in uh, the factory. I'm really happy to say it's going in in two weeks' time, our first one. Um, and we're doing then the pièce de résistance, which is this serpentine cafe, and it's about injecting theater into every day. And for those of you who don't know the serpentine, um, it's in between uh, Kensington Gardens and Hyde Park. And it's a real mecca of, of innovation. It is serpentine pavilions every year, and uh, they really challenge uh, what, what it is in architecture. And we evolved the serpent. We wanted to create actually a more smiley face, a beautiful stingray, something that stops you, but then something that welcomes you. And as you walk in, you reveal this, this lovely undulant um, experience. Because I know I'm going desperately over time, we're working with uh, very good engineers, the biggest in the world, to create fast, file to factory, easy to assemble. Last project. Last project is an eight-story building. And the reason why I wanted to leave this last is because in Malta, we're obsessed with low-rise, medium, flats. We build flats everywhere. And um, we've approached this flat, these, these block of flats, which is mixed use, um, to express the balconies. We, we wanted to look at a tree. And we said, well, let's grow our balconies and let's, um, let's simply grow a, a tree root into them and become a, become a tree, become a plant. And we then have looked at um, molding concrete. You know, concrete is such a, a soulless material, but actually if you can mold it, there are beautiful stones and chips which are very tactile and texture that you can touch. And again, like Chiswick House School, modularity, modules which you can then take and easily produce offside. This building is just made out of five modules. One, two, three, four, actually four, and then there's some bespoke ones up here. It's just a, it's just a square with one curve on the end, and for you more, it's not much more expensive than a normal building. And you know, I wanted to leave you on that because this is our built reality. 
and, and there's no reason why a, tree, a building can't be a tree, it can't be something natural. Um, and I've got to finish now, so I, I hope that uh, that's given you an insight into how we can really look at things. I, was, I thought Mark Buckley's quote about not slowing down, but actually about reversing is, 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 is the right thing. That's what we really need to do. We need to just completely redefine our ways. And, I, and I'm excited to be back in Malta, and I, and I hope that we can, uh, if I can contribute or work with you to help develop this island in a better way. That'd be great, so thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Jonathan Mitzi. Jonathan, I'm gonna, listen, <laughs> just, just before you go, I know time's up, but I have to ask you, right, if there's one thing, if there's one thing you want the people that are listening to you right now, and also when this is online as well, to, to do here in Malta, what would you say? Um, well, I think we need to start from a planning point of view, really start looking at a holistic master plan for all our high-rise zones, because actually we don't have a high-rise policy. I've read every single word, and it's every single word, and it's super ambiguous, and um, it, it really places the onus on the developers to come up with uh, an argument to, to justify why they get to build a tower. And that's not the right way. I mean, we need a serious national planning policy that, uh, that comes from serious studies. Uh, traffic impact assessments on steroids, you know? I mean, it's, it's um, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I so can go on, but you know, sure, there was, sure. it's, it's, it's not about, about uh, making hay whilst the sun shine and being the fastest growing economy in Europe. It's about sustainable, growth and you know if we keep going super fast um, there's not going to be much of an island left and and I'm very uh, emotionally conflicted being yeah. an architect on this island mm -hmm. because you know we're there to create and build but actually we've built so much and even that school you know it's on virgin land but or, you know we've tried to be as, as sensitive as possible Ladies and gentlemen, anyway. listen, if you, if you agree or if you'd like to have a chat, please grab Jonathan, have a coffee and explain. Jonathan Mitzi, thank you so much.